He even knew roughly that they were coming from the northwest. The question was, where exactly were they all? For days, American aircraft have been sent out from Midway across the vast stretch of the Pacific Ocean, searching for the Japanese fleet. June 4th, 1942, research was really hotting up. The codebreakers had discovered that the Japanese planned to attack on the fort, but there was still no sign of their fleet. The Pacific Ocean covers a quarter of the Earth's surface. For the Americans in their, their big and slow flying boats, fighting the Japanese fleet in just a small sector of this vast expanse was an enormous task. In fact, the four Japanese carriers had got within range of Midway without being spotted, and they had already launched their strike force. Finally, at 5.40 that morning, an American scout plane spotted the huge formation of Japanese bombers and fighters heading towards Midway. The American pilot sent back an urgent warning. It was not a moment too soon. The Japanese planes were aiming to destroy the parked American aircraft on the ground. The Battle of Midway was about to begin. Within minutes, nearly every one of the American planes on Midway was taking off. The Americans were desperate not to be caught on the ground, as they had been at Pearl Hub. A mixed batch of over 40 torpedo planes and bombers was dispatched without fighter escort to strike the distant Japanese fleet. And 25 fighters were sent up to intercept the formidable array of Japanese fighters and bombers that would soon arrive to attack Midway. The American fighter pilots were in for a rough ride. Many of them had only just finished flight school and didn't have that many hours of flying under their belts. To make matters worse, even the best American fighter aircraft, this one, the Wildcat, was totally outmaneuvered by the Japanese fighter, the Zero. The Zero could outrun and outclimb anything the Americans could put in the sky against them. These Zeros were going to be a real threat to the 25 American fighters sent to intercept them. Suddenly, Wildcats appeared and dashed through our formation. Our Zero fighters saw this, and in a five-minute dogfight, all the Wildcats were chased away. The American fighters did manage to shoot down a couple of enemy bombers, but for the most part, they didn't stand a chance against the Japanese in their Zeros. After all, the Japanese pilots were among the most experienced and best trained naval aviators in the world. After only a few minutes, nearly every single American fighter that had taken off from Midway had been shot down into the ocean. At 6.34 a.m., the Japanese arrived over Midway and began attacking the airfield. The Americans fought back bravely, but their island base was shattered. Despite the destruction they'd inflicted, the Japanese realized that their real targets were missing. The American bombers weren't there. Within minutes, the news that the American bombers had not been destroyed on the ground by the attack on Midway 
reached Vice Admiral de Grumeau on his flagship, the carrier Akagi. But he didn't have long to wait to find out where they'd gone. They were now directly above his carrier fleet and beginning their attack. As the American bombers dived into action, they were pounced on by Japanese Zeros. Many of the Americans were shot down. The rest turned back for midway. Not one of their bombs or torpedoes had hit its mark. Nagumo's fleet had escaped this time, but he knew the surviving American bombers were still a threat. They could refuel on Midway and return to attack him. He had to destroy them when they landed on the island. On his carriers, Nagumo still had reserve aircraft. The trouble was they had the wrong weapons. They were armed with anti-ship weapons in case the US Navy showed up. But Nagumo was still unaware there were any American ships around, so he felt safe replacing these anti-ship weapons with land bombs to attack Midway. Below decks in the aircraft storage hangars of the Japanese carriers, new orders rang out. The crews quickly set to work removing the anti-ship weapons on the reserve planes and replacing them with bombs for a ground attack on Midway. While his men worked furiously on the hangar decks below, Nagumo, on the bridge, was suddenly confronted with a real crisis. He received another message, this time from one of his scout planes. It had spotted what appeared to be 10 American ships northeast of Midway. The news came as a stunning shock. Nagumo had been sure there would be no American ships in the area. It was now blindingly obvious that things were not going as the Japanese had planned. Nagumo immediately suspended the planned second strike on Midway. He now had to deal with the threat from the American ships. He ordered his men to reattach the anti-ship weapons onto the reserve planes. And he sent a message straight back to his scout plane, demanding more information. If the American ships were carriers, Nagumo could be in real trouble. The American ships were, of course, carriers. And earlier that morning, they had found the Japanese fleet. On board the American ships, preparations were gathering pace. The carriers Hornet and Enterprise were readying to launch their aircraft. In command of these two ships was Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance, and now he had a critical decision to make. Spruance's carriers were located about 200 miles away from Midway, here on the map case. Yorktown was a little way off on its own. U.S. scout planes had reported the Japanese carriers about 155 miles away from Spruance's position. The Japanese ships were within striking distance of some of his aircraft, but others could barely carry enough fuel to get there and back. There'd be little leeway for them to maneuver, even less for navigational errors. And if they ran out of fuel, the only place to go would be into the empty wastes of the Pacific. But Spruance decided that the critical issue was time. He had to hit the Japanese fleet before they discovered and annihilated his ships. He couldn't waste time moving his carriers any closer to the enemy to give his planes a better chance. So, in one of the greatest naval gambles in history, Spruance ordered all his aircraft into the air in one massed attack. On board the American carriers, pilots made their final preparations. Many were nervous, especially on the Hornet. The Hornet's torpedoes